Life is so busy, if you blink, you can miss something amazing. It's important to take a moment and enjoy what we have and the people around us. I'm Mo Hagen, Chief Operating Officer for Canfit Pro, and welcome to A Moment with Mo, a podcast where I will welcome some incredible guests to talk fitness and nutrition, mindset and self-improvement, setting your goals into action, and much, much more. Now let's get chatting. Hello, everyone, and welcome to A Moment with Mo. This is episode number 13, and our theme today is living your legacy. Traditionally, we hear about legacy as leaving your legacy, and that is leaving behind your contributions and the impact and influence that you make in your life for others that help to shape their present and their future. And I really love the concept of living your legacy as it is a way to put into practice living on purpose and living your purpose. So it's a bit of a different spin on legacy. It's super powerful these days because more and more we're drawn to those that influence us and help to steer us in the right direction and help give us courage through their own lived experiences on how you too can step into that opportunity to live your purpose, otherwise known as living your why. I've been inspired about this living your legacy for quite some time. And my guest today is famous for telling me, Mo, stop talking about it and let's just do it. So today, I can't think of a better person to discuss living your legacy than the one and only Helen Vandenberg. And I've had the privilege of uh, delving into this extraordinary human's life and story. I've been privileged to call Helen a dear friend for, we're not even sure how many years, but we're going to chat about that. But what I'd love to say before I bring her on to the show today is just a little bit about why Helen is the person to talk about living your legacy. She's a true testament of a life rich in diverse experiences, achievements, contributions, and someone who I believe, and I know for those who know Helen, also believe that she is someone who exemplifies living your legacy. With over 40 years in experience in club business operations, program development and consulting, Helen has been recognized more times than I even know, and I'm a big fan. I want to highlight just a few. Helen is known as Kenna's top fitness educator, the CanFit Pro 2018 Lifetime Achievement Award recipient. She has what we call the Idea Bookend Awards Program Director of the Year, Fitness Presenter of the Year. She is a top industry contributor, continues to be decade after decade. That is truly one of a kind. And with a profound commitment to sport, fitness, and empowerment, Helen has crafted a legacy that excels the traditional boundaries. As I mentioned, I've known Helen, and we think it is 1990, could have been sooner, but we're going to chat about our first encounter and many encounters that we've had since. And um, I do want to say, as I've been saying all year long, it is so important to be at events. You just don't know who you're going to meet. And this is exactly what it means talking to Helen, because my first international conference that I was privileged to go to in 1990 literally changed my life and my career trajectory. And the person I met walking up the escalator in her famous Calgary, as in her cowboy boots, her short denim shorts with white lace And a brilliant top and jacket, as Helen would always be so fashionably dressed. I want to welcome Helen Vandenberg. Hello. (laughs) And you are just as fashionably dressed because one thing you do so well is you teach and jump into an interview and you don't even look like, you just look like you came out of the boutique. Okay. Well, I appreciate that because if you saw the bottom half, you'd know I just finished teaching a class. So there you go. Uh, Tights on the bottom, nice top on the top, you know. (laughs) That's how we roll. That's how we roll. Oh, well, thanks so much for saying yes. And I want to say to all of you, but Helen, I just have to say, candidly, the reason I invited you to my podcast is not only are you someone I've loved to have on my show since I started a year ago, 
well, 11 months ago. <laughs> but really, this is just a really f- great opportunity for you and I to catch up because it's yeah. been a while. It has been a while. And, you know, you're a busy person. I'm a busy person. So I always appreciate the time that we get together um, because, as you know, and we, we've been on the road together and we've had the opportunity to sit down to actually some quiet meals sometimes, which was really nice, is that we share very similar ideas and it's always great to be around like-minded people because that just builds you up when you are with people who are like-minded. And so I love spending time with you. Oh, thank you. And the same goes to you. And you know, because you are a trainer of leadership and you know that we want to be in the room with those who not only lift us up, but also give us courage to step into opportunities. And, and you've been that for me for all the decades and we, we got to figure this one out. So yeah. first of all, before we jump into your sport, your incredible story of your world renowned mm-hmm. sport of synchronized swimming, something you might not know that connects us. I'll tell you in a moment. I just want to say, was it 1990 where I met you at the idea conference in San Diego? It was San Diego and the famous outfit you're talking about was, you know, the eighties. It was definitely the eighties. It was all about the short shorts and the lace and the, you know, the Madonna. I was trying to be Madonna lookalike. Truly. (laughs) (laughs) Well, you are famous for uh, dressing fashionably, not only with the times, but to bring back the trends and make them new again. I do have to say that I saw you at the, uh, Asia Fit event, and you were in costume there as well for their mm-hmm. Saturday party, which I terribly missed not being there. Well, you know me, I, you know, uh, I'll never miss an opportunity to dress up. <laughs> Absolutely. All right. Well, listen, I want to take us back a bit. Um, one thing you might not know, and I didn't really connect the dates, therefore the dots, mm. but I was, I suddenly fell in love with the sport of synchronized swimming. I wasn't even a good swimmer, but it was such a hot sport in the eighties when I was in university Mm -hmm. and I decided to try out for the synchronized swimming team at, at my university Western. And they gave some, like, first of all, jump in the pool and swim so many, so many lengths, which I didn't even understand the lingo but I wanted to be a synchro swimmer. And why? Well, let me tell you, everyone that's listening and watching, this is why. Helen, you were the first non-American to win the World Synchronized Swimming Championships at both the solo and the duo events at the 1978 World Aquatic Championships in West Berlin. Then you went on to win gold in both the solo and duet at the 1979 Pan American Games. Then you received Canada's Outstanding Female Athlete of the Year in 1979, then elected to the Canadian Sports Hall of Fame in 1983. That was the year I swam the All-Ontario Synchronized Swimming Championships in duet. And then in 1985, you were inducted into the International Swimming Hall of Fame. (laughs) And I heard all about this Helen Vanderberg, why you were all over the news as the first non-American, therefore... And not to mention non-American, you were a Canadian winning Mm -hmm. the world championships. So I wanted to ask you, and you've told me, because you you, you talked about your preparing for the world championships and what you had to overcome, the challenges, one being in here, mindset, belief, right? You had a lot of pressure as a Canadian to win the world championships. What were some of the challenges you faced at the time and how did you overcome them? Mm -hmm. And then I want to talk about your thoughts around how you inspired synchronized swimming to become an Olympic sport. But let's start about challenge. Then we can talk about, you know, change. Yeah, you know, it takes me back. And actually, it's interesting as you're even having when you're asking these questions, I can bring myself right back to the place I was in the 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 pool, the locker room, the smells, everything about the world championships are still like very fresh in my mind. And the challenges and, and as you kind of indicated was really about 
the mind, the mindset. And it's probably the first time at the age of 18 that I really understood the power our minds have. And they can take us in either direction. And they can take us into a a direction where we spiral downward, or they can take us into a direction where we spiral into a, a positive mindset. And I experienced that building up to the world championships and then at the actual world championships itself. And at the end of the day, you can train and you can practice and you can have knowledge and you can have all of this experience. But unless you can tame your mind and master how your mind behaves, that is often the failure that athletes have. And I face that. And I am just like anyone else. I have self-doubt. I don't believe in myself at times. I, I lose confidence. And I think what's interesting about a lot of athletes is we look at them and think, well, they're super confident and they're, they're always on their game. It's like, that's actually not true. We have the same self-doubt than anyone had. Going into the world championships, I had self-doubt. In fact, I... <laughs> Right prior to the world championships, I went into a little local meet in in Sweden and I did not place well in the Uh compulsory figures competition at this meet, which spiraled my mindset into a negative place that I wasn't deserving of even considering being a world champion. Fortunately, I had great coaches who had worked with me and understood my mindset and how to get me out of that train of thought. And then I had to work my way back to going, yes, I can. Yes, I can. And move out of this negative um, thought. And that took me, it was a week before world champions where I spiraled down downward. So I had prepared for years to become the first Canadian to win a gold medal. That's how I'd been positioned uh, and had driven my training and my goals towards that. And to think a week before I was thinking I didn't even deserve to be at this competition. So it really was digging myself out mentally because physically I had the skills, but mentally I doubted myself. And and as soon as doubt comes in, performance goes down. Mm -hmm. And my coaches saw that. They saw my performance going down. And so we had to work not in the pool, but out of the pool on what was going in my head. Now, I've shared this story with Mo before, and I've, I've talked about this in some of my keynote addresses. But the biggest moment for me was right before the final competition of the solo event. So the solo event happened before the duet event. So I went into the duet event as a gold medalist. Mm. So I was already mentally prepared. I saw myself as a gold medalist. But before the solo event, I did not see myself as a gold medalist. I saw myself as somebody that was not deserving to even be at the world championships. Just before I swam, I was in the locker room and I was in the toilet stall talking to myself. Self, what are you going to do? You have a choice. You can either get through the performance, and it was a three and a half minute performance, and just get through it and get on the flight and go home and retire. Or you can go out there and do what you've been trained to do, your best performance. Whatever your best performance is, go out there and do what you've been trained to do. Well, these voices battled back and forth, back and forth. Just get through it. You, you, you can do this. You know, yes, no, yes, no. As we all have these voices in our head. And it wasn't until the announcer said, Helen Vandenberg, Canada, and it was my turn to step on the deck, that one voice has to lead. And that's the thing I also learned that I think is su- super valuable, is that in the moment of being in performance, only one voice can lead. And you need to determine which voice that is. And for me, I determined the voice that was going to be the lead voice for me was the mindset of I am going to do my very best. I'm going to go out there and give it all I've got. And it was the best three and a half minutes of my life. I had so much fun. I didn't even know if I was going to win a gold medal or not. (laughs) Wow. Wow. I'm my heart's pounding hearing this and I've heard your keynotes. I've heard this story. And this is, we could stop this interview right now because this is living your legacy right there. 
because you yeah. gave the, a powerful, very humbling, authentic example of living your legacy. And that is you need to, you know, work on the things that are, you know, holding you back holding and you back. Need to get with good coaches. You need to have a coach to help you. We all need a coach. doesn't matter yeah. what sport, what role, what company, where you are in your life. We all need someone to support us, especially at times where we're struggling. Yeah. And there's that theory of when you're doing well, reach down and help others. When you're struggling, reach up and ask for help. Right. So right. that's the example of living your legacy. And here's the proof. And I'm just going to say this. Um, I might, some people might know me for my power poses, my three power poses. Yes. I teach. Well, every time I go into a meeting that I'm nervous about or a presentation or I'm backstage about to go on stage, you will catch me in the green room, in a bathroom, in a toilet stall, power posing and doing my affirmations with them. Every time I do, Helen, I think of your story in the toilet. At the- <laughs> and I go, I'm not walking onto a deck at a world championship. I'm going to a bloody meeting like Mo. <laughs> You've got this. But you know what? It is the same thing. And that's, you know, people always say, you know, what are some of the lessons you learn from sport that you carry forward? And that's one of the big things is like, you do need to have that self-talk and however you need to do it. If that means you need to, to run around for a little bit, if it means you need to, you know, do your power pose, whatever it is that helps you to get into the frame of mind you need to get into. And, I agree with you full heartedly. We all need coaches because when we start spiraling downwards and we start thinking that we're not good, we need somebody just to remind us. We need that person to say, you are good. Remember all of these good things that you've done or you're capable of doing. And you just need those reminders. And when you consider that, as you said, we can do that for others. Yes, absolutely. And that's what it's all about. It's helping others find their purpose, their strengths, how yeah. you can, by role modeling, show them the path forward. And that's what it's all about. And why wait till your life is over for others to go, wow, I learned a lot from Helen and I'm going to apply what I've learned instead, you know, after Helen leaves this life, I'm going <laughs> to, I'm going to represent Helen's teachings by showing others the way, like pay it forward. Pay so it that's forward. what I hope that we're doing here today. I would love to get in your mind and ask you, because I don't think I've ever asked you this, is what does it mean to you to know that you contributed to the sport of synchronized swimming, becoming an Olympic sport? Because it did starting in 1984 and you were involved still in synchro, or I believe, tell us when you retired from the sport, but I think it was around after it launched or just before it became an Olympic sport. What does that mean to you to know that you participated on lifting the sport up. Interesting that you should ask that question is that when, when I was competing and, and why I got to where I was, and I'll just share this story. It's a little bit of a sidebar is that I truly am competitive with myself. I want to be the best that I can be. And so in, in my journey in competition, I never saw myself as a world champion, an Olympian or any of those things. I, all I just wanted to be really good. And every time I took the next step and think about this, when you're talking about goal setting for yourself or for clients that you work with is like, when I took the next step, it just gave me confidence to then go to the next step to say, Oh, I could be even better or I can be even better. I can improve that. You know, I got to this place, but Oh, I could be better. So I kept just, you know, stepping up, stepping up and stepping up until I got to this place where I was like, I'm a world champion. And in that process, the Olympic Games became an opportunity for synchronized swimming. And it was right before the world championships that the the Olympic Committee recognized that synchronized swimming was a sport. Mm. Prior to that, synchronized swimming was thought to be artistic and not necessarily a sport. And so my final years of swimming were all about it needs to be powerful. 
We need to be you know, athletic in the in the water. We need to get rid of the idea that, you know, we're just floating and looking pretty in the water and that we actually are strong athletes. And, and we weren't recognized as strong athletes until the last few years of my my time swimming. And it was prior to just prior to the world championships that the OFC uh, said that synchronized swimming would be uh, a demonstration sport in the 1980 Olympics. Ah. And then come into the Olympics for 1984. Yeah. Wow. Now you all remember what happened in 1980. Uh-huh. Canadian yeah. boycott. Yeah. So the Canadian boycott in 1980, my opportunity would have, would have been not to be a competitor, but to be as a demonstration sport, which for me was huge. We mm -hmm. got our way into the Olympics. We were now stepping in and being recognized as a sport mm -hmm. rather than being artistic. Wow. <laughs> I didn't put that together. The reason I know we boycotted is I was a big follower of Olympians in that year. Um, had the you know, had the opportunity of going to one of the Olympics, but my boss, your dear friend, David Patch Evans was yes. also to be at that Olympics for rowing. That's right. That's right. Uh, so yeah, yes, we boycotted. I can't even remember what the argument was about, but you know, politics, it was an argument of some sort yeah. and the Olympics was canceled. And my coach actually sat me down right after that. And she said, she said, Helen, you could reign the world for four more years. This is what came out of her mouth. She said, you could reign the world for four more years. Uh, there's nobody who can touch you right now. And I, I turned to her, I said, I love you. I love the sport, but four more years of my life in the pool, it's time for me to move on. And that was one of the best decisions I ever made. And it wasn't an easy decision, but it was very clear to me that I had pushed myself to a place where I had excelled at that. And I was ready to now take on a new challenge. Mm -hmm. And many athletes have a difficult time making that transition or making the decision is like, is this the right time? And it was very clear to me that this was the right time for me. And in 1984, I went to the games. I saw our Canadian synchronized swimmers uh, compete. They were amazing. And uh, they came in silver at that, at yeah. that Olympics and the next Olympics, they won gold. So there yeah. you go. <laughs> there you go. And, and there you go. You showed others the way and we can be proud to say, and I'm sure you feel so proud when you look back on the legacy that you are living, you inspired so many to join the sport of synchronized swimming and go after their dreams, living again, the mm -hmm. dream you created for the world. And that is they got, they've gotten to compete and Canada has done so well in synchronized swimming uh, oh, wow. since that day. So, uh, so many athletes that are grateful for, uh, your contribution and the achievements to make it possible, but also give them the belief that they too can be a Helen Vanderberg and uh, be a Olympic athlete. So there you go. There you heard yeah. it here. Yeah. Um, if I can just share a little yeah. tiny story, and I'm sure this person would not mind if I mentioned her name, but Michelle Cameron yeah. did win the gold medal in the Olympics in 1988. So she won the gold medal. And I remember her. She swam when I was swimming. She was a little girl. And she shared the story with me that she would put her goggles on, go underwater and watch me while we we're while I was doing my training. And she was just a young, young athlete. Maybe she was 12, 11 or 12 at the time. But she shares that story to this day where she's like, I just got under the water and stared at you through my goggles because I thought that way I could absorb some of your talent. Well, oh. then... There you go. She became a gold medalist. <laughs> oh, God. Makes me want to cry. I know. <laughs> Isn't that incredible? Oh, man. Yeah. I'm just soaking that one in. It's it's amazing, just the impact. And I, I love the fact that she was able to share that with you. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. She, she was very, very, very open about that. She said, oh, yeah, I got to tell you this story. <laughs> well, maybe that's another teachable moment, everyone, is, you know, when someone shares a story or an experience that you help inspire in them and they tell you that, take it in and, and help it, be, you know, fuel you to keep doing what you're doing and to keep paving the path forward for others. But what a competitor under the water. Well, you know, I remember the day that you won the program director of the year. And I remember sitting in the audience with my friend Dottie Rao from Grand Cayman. And I said, 
I'm going to be on that stage one day. Mm-hmm. And I followed everything you did as a program director. I, you know, you were my mentor. You pr- didn't even know it at the time. Cause you know, I kind of, I kind of, um, what does it say? Followed everything you did without like stalking you virtually. You didn't know it, but uh, <laughs> yeah. quietly. Yeah. quietly. <laughs> and I asked you lots of advice along the way. Yeah. Um, all right. So I think I'm going to sort of jump into the question around, um, you know, you, you were inducted into the Canadian Sports Hall of Fame. What an illustrious career you've had. You're also a CanFit Pro Lifetime Achievement recipient. I remember that moment mm-hmm. on stage. Um, we convinced you to dress up for the anniversary and go back in trends time. So we thought, yeah. what a perfect time to give you this award without you knowing it. The question for you is what values or principles have guided you in your journey, both in sports and in the fitness industry? Mm. This is a really, really good question and probably not simple to answer, but there's a few things that come to to mind immediately. Number one is if I make a commitment, I follow through and it's just part of what I value. So when people say, you know, will you do this? If I say yes, I will do it, even if it's going to be hard to do. Uh, and, and maybe part of, you know, that is because of my swimming career that, you know, making a commitment was part of what you learn to do at a very young age. And if you get to get up at five o'clock in the morning to swim, you're there. You, you, there's no excuses. And, you know, and sport teaches you that, like there aren't any excuses. You, mm-hmm. you have to commit. If you committed to something, mm-hmm. you follow through on it. And, and that's kind of a, a big thing for me. And is it probably one of the things I struggle with when I work in management is like, you said you were going to do it. You got to do it <laughs> because that's, you know, a very important thing to me. And mm-hmm. I think you mentioned it earlier as well in the introduction is that I believe you just got to step in. You're not going to be perfect. It's not going to be beautiful the first time. It's going to be messy, but I believe in stepping in. You got to step in to whatever it is you're thinking of doing. And if you step in, then you can start to finesse it. And as I said, I, I learned that as a young athlete. It's like I stepped into swimming. I never thought it was going to be a world champion. That's not what my intention was. I stepped in because I wanted to do this. And then as I did it, course it grew and it grew and it grew Mm -hmm. that's brilliant and very powerful uh commitment commitment is consistency right and it's It's easy the first time because it's kind of like well that was fun or look at you know but then you got to do it consistently and that's when commitment truly is commitment and it's hard especially when people and things are pulling you in multiple directions but when it is your values it's ingrained in who you are um, I, it does make it easier to do that hard the work. hard work. Yeah. 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 And, and I think what, you know, go long, goes along with commitment and, and what you're saying too, is that perseverance. It's like, it's, it is hard work. And I don't, I don't think anybody, it doesn't matter what you're going after. It's never easy, right? There's always going to be hurdles and, and there's going to be objections and, and, you know, stumbling blocks along the way. And it's that perseverance to say, okay, that was a stumbling block or that was a barrier or that didn't go well. How do I work my way around that? How do I improve to go to the next step? Mm -hmm. And that's, there's a lot of joy in that experience as well. Mm -hmm. Although in, in the moment, it may not be easy. Often when I'm struggling through something and again, it's messy and I have no idea what I'm doing. I I tend to do two things. I go back to sport to think, okay, this is kilometer 13 or this is kilometer whatever. If it's a Mm -hmm. half or a full, I think I take myself back to when it's hard. I know where I am in the race. I think, okay, if I can run that last kilometer and 0.2, I can do this. So I think back to sport. And then I always think about the lesson and the opportunity that is going to be there at the end. It's like the prize. It's like the finish line. It's like, Mm -hmm. I'm going to get the medal. So just keep grinding because there's going to be something in it that is going to help me learn about me or help me help others. Mm -hmm. And that is where then the commitment and the perseverance is, yeah, it's hard, but it doesn't feel as hard in my mindset as it may be in other ways. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. It is really about, it is 
and it, and it is everybody's different in how we get there, but it is determining how you get yourself to visualize to the place where you can finish, where you can get to the finish line, where you can achieve whatever it is you put out in front of your yourself. Mm -hmm. And I love the word that you used opportunity. I think that's something that, you know, kept me going and swimming. Actually, at the age of 14, I was going to retire from swimming, (laughs) retire Mm. at the age of 14. I was going (laughs) to quit. I was going to quit because the pressure was too high. I had Mm. just won the junior national competition in Canada and, and for solo duet and team, I won three gold medals and they were going to move me into the seniors. And I just felt too much pressure. Like I just, I couldn't manage the, the pressure at 14. And I'll never forget my coaches and my parents. They both said, sit down and write the list of your pros and cons. Like why you want to stay, why you want to leave. What's the value of staying? What's the value uh, of leaving? And that process for me showed the opportunity that oh. I had an opportunity to do something that was uniquely different if I continued on with my swimming career. And I had the opportunity to see where it could take me. And whereas if I retired at the age of 14, uh, that opportunity was no longer there. And so I remember looking at the list going, mm, opportunity, I'm going to take the opportunity. Wow. My mom taught me that as well. I wrote so many pros and cons lists. And whenever I struggled through, you know, when I wanted to quit synchro, quit (laughs) school, quit, quit, quit. I should have used that earlier this week. It would have helped me because I wanted to quit a few times over um, a few issues, but I did persevere and I was committed probably because I really want my iPhone to work. Yeah. So, There you go. But that is a good life lesson as well. And um, one that uh, we both learned from our parents and perhaps and your coach. Um, And good thing that we got that. I mean, sometimes it's as simple as just going through that exercise and Mm -hmm. allowing your and the fact that you figured it out for yourself and you saw the opportunity for yourself because that's what injected the motivation for you then Mm -hmm. to continue on despite the pressure. Yeah, yeah. got to figure it out ourselves sometimes. We do. And, and sometimes, it, and then and that's why I think journaling is really valuable for people as well. We just, when we get into the chaos in our mind and it gets really messy in our head and we can't kind of see, as I say, the, the forest or the trees or is that how the saying goes? Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, we just can't see it. And then when you write it down, it just helps you to get that clarity that, it cleans up your thoughts a little bit mm. where you're like, Oh, okay. I got a little bit more clarity now than I had before. Mm-hmm. Another great tip journaling. Mm. Very good. I love journaling. I, I would like, I am in the process of learning how to be a better journaling person, but I love it for the end of a week and the start of a week. Mm. Yeah. So I'm good at the bookends. I want to just get, I'm going to be better in the middle very soon because I just learned the value of that from you. So at the very beginning, I defined why we're here as my intrigue around the power of living your legacy versus leaving a legacy. Mm. In the context of living your legacy, how would you define that, Helen? Or what does it mean to you personally? I love the idea of living your legacy. And I completely agree with you in, in what you said as far as we think of legacy after we've left. And we have an opportunity, there's that word again, an opportunity while we're here to affect and change the world, however it is you want to. And uh, something that I was thinking about while we were talking earlier is the whole concept of the ripple effect. And I go back to Michelle Cameron with her goggles under the water watching me swim. I had no idea she was doing that. She was gaining something from that. And it wasn't until years later that I realized how I had impacted her life. And we don't know how we impact the world around us. So one of the things that comes to mind when you're saying living your purpose, your legacy, is consider every action you do every day. Because that is your legacy. As human beings, we are laying down our legacy every moment right? with every action that we're doing. Because that action has a reaction. 
And it doesn't matter if it's a reaction with another person, a reaction to the environment, whatever it is, we affect the world in everything that we're doing. And that's living our legacy in this moment. And so even when you asked me to do this podcast, it got me thinking about, am I doing it regularly enough? Am I living the legacy that I want to leave every moment? And there's times where I'm going to say, no, I'm not. <laughs> I'm not that person. And But it's good to bring it back to the forefront of my mind to go, am I living the legacy I want? Am I living with kindness? Am I being kind to people? That's one of the values that I think is super important. And am I, am I being good? Am I being good? And whatever that is in your definition, um, am I inspiring others? You know, the, all these kinds of words come to me as far as living the legacy in the moment, mm -hmm. living it. Yeah. Ooh, I was sitting here thinking about that. You just shared a really valuable lesson. And I'm, I, as as a physiotherapist, I'm just going to say that is such listening to you reflect on what living your legacy means. And that is how you, and the ripple effect that every action creates a reaction. I think to myself, it made me really go back in my mind quickly in my head and ask myself, okay, Monday, was I li living my Tuesday, <laughs> Wednesday. I <laughs> and I honestly can say to all of you that I would love to repeat this week. I'm just saying, because, and thank you, because we're human, so we're not yeah, perfect. We're human. But it is wonderful to think about what legacy means to you and how you want to show up in this world because everyone, especially those that are inspired by not not what you do, but who you are, there's mm -hmm. the key, who you will are. be following and watching and learning, putting their goggles on and following you. And so we need to ask ourselves, are we living our purpose? And are we mm -hmm. in, are we really in our authentic, purposeful self every day? Is this how we want to be? And if we don't like the answer, then the opportunity is that we can journal, dump the Dump not the stuff so good. Yeah. And then we can flip the switch and then live, you know, move forward from our mm -hmm. lesson learned. So that in itself, I love what you've just shared. And you are, you are absolutely known in the fitness industry as someone who teaches what the ripple effect is about. You've used it mm -hmm. many times. It's part yeah. of your brand, but it's a yeah. powerful lesson for every single person. Yeah. And, and, you know, and, and it's funny because I wrote down a statement uh, when we were talking about this and, and I want to just share it. It's like it, something that I'm going to carry forward from this interview forward is asking myself every day, am I leaving it better than when I came? And that's not passing away, Kane. That's like that last moment I just had. Right? It was the last moment. Right. That's my past was, OK, did I leave it better or did I leave it worse? Wow. <laughs> wow. Well, one thing I know when Helen speaks, we all take so much in and, you know, gain so many insights. I do want to ask you another one is, um, you know, you've achieved a lot of success in your personal and professional career and you've inspired so many. I, I wonder if you really have taken the moment or moments to, you know, at the end of the conference, I know we've shared wine and <laughs> dinners and shopping together. And we ask, you know, we talk about the conference experience, but do we mm -hmm. ever stop to really reflect on who it is that we have inspired or how we have inspired? Can you share a sort of a, one of those most memorable moments where you felt the impact of your influence on someone else or someone's career? Um, well, other than the, you know, the story about Michelle Cameron winning a gold medal mm -hmm. at the Olympics, that was definitely uh, one that, that stands out in my mind. Yeah. But the other stories that stand out in my mind are people that will say things to me and I don't even know their names. They are just people who have been in passing in my life who will stop and share a moment. And even to this day, I wouldn't be able to say, oh, so-and-so from such and such a place. It was just a person who 
during my journey of life, we cross paths. And during that crossing of a path, there was a word spoken or a statement made or an inspiration that was given that changed the tra- trajectory of that person's life. And I've had people come up to me. I've had people come up to me at Camp Fit Pro conventions and said um, that I did change their life. You know, that they were struggling with something and something I said moved them into a positive direction and they moved out of a negative situation that they were in. And 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 truly, it's people that I wouldn't even have known that I had met in the past that would share these stories. And I'd be like, wow, that <laughs> thank you. you, didn't, you didn't. <laughs> Yeah. Thank you. Ben, that's why I think that's why I probably th- feel so strongly about the ripple effect, because it's just often you don't even know. It could be as simple as a, you smiled at somebody when they really needed a smile that day. And that changed changed something for them. Mm-hmm. That truly is the ripple effect. We don't always see when we skip the stone in the water. We see that first couple skips, but we may not even see the ripples or underneath the water where the stone continues to go. You just have to know that we threw that stone and we gave, you know, we sparked something. We sparked something for someone. And, you know, and for me, I wouldn't even even know. I wouldn't, I would not know. I would not know who I've affected over time unless they, you know, would share it. You know, Shelby or, you know, you are in this conversation today. And, you know, that's always, you know, so nice to hear. (laughs) It is. I'm going to say to all of you that are are uh, viewing and listening today, you know, give that gift. Let that person know that has had that effect on you, that has impacted you in some way through whether they know it or not. Make sure they know it. Let them know. One thing I, I learned two things through the pandemic. I get I call them silver linings, Helen. One, I made a commitment as part of my own therapy because I'm a people person. I, I need to be around people. And of course we're isolated at home. I, I wrote a letter every single week to someone out of the blue and just said, I'm thinking of you and, or I'm thinking of you because da, da, da. I couldn't believe how many people actually called me back, wrote me back and said, your letter came on a day that I just really needed a lift. And that has reinforced to me the power of going back to the old fashioned put something in an envelope, put a stamp on it. And I absolutely love it. It's kind of like therapy. I write a letter to people, even if I could just say it in an email. And then the second silver lining was just letting people know how you impacted their day, especially if you get to do it in person. Even if you can't do it in person, do it through virtual, Mm -hmm. but just letting people know we need more of that in our lives today because we're all lost in the technology and the remoteness of yes. life. Mm-hmm. So I, again, that ripple effect and hopefully by you sharing that impact, it'll inspire them to pay it forward and do the same for others. Having yeah. learned perhaps from you or because of that one little letter, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And that's actually something that personally I want to work on more is letting people know the people who have influenced me uh, just uh, recently, I took my two coaches out for, for dinner and the two coaches that inspired me during my, my swimming career. And uh, I think they were really surprised when I ca- contacted them and said, I just want to take you out for dinner. <laughs> and they're like, what? I'm like, yeah, I just want to take you out for dinner. And I'm trying to myself be better at doing exactly what you're saying is just mm-hmm. reaching out to those people who have influenced your life and letting them know that because yeah. often we don't know it. It's so rewarding for both sides. I always mm-hmm. feel like my heart grows bigger when I, you know, connect with somebody. Yeah. And even if it's for, but I can totally relate. I take, I took my physiotherapist and my classmates out for dinner not long ago. And it was the same thing. We reminisced and had a drink and had a quick bite. And it was like, so heartfelt and it was like, just bringing the past to the present and yeah and and that again is the gift of just reconnecting with those who you know really impacted or contributed and, and they would then get a sense of you know knowing just how much they have impacted we all need that we, we all, we need, all that. need that every everybody does need it and then in the much mm-hmm. as much as we can share it with the people who have impacted our lives it's like we should start that that circle of you know 
Yeah. Recognition. Recognition. Exactly. Circle what of recognition. The circle of recognition. Yeah. I love it. All yeah. right. Well, we've got it. I have a couple, I could talk to you for hours, but we're yes. going to wrap up with a couple more. Um, you know, we talked about, uh, you have achieved so much and been recognized with so many different awards. I'd love just to ask though, having received the Camfit Pro Lifetime Achievement Award, what advice would you give or have for individuals seeking to make lasting impact in their respected fields? Mm. Mm. Always be a student. Mm. Be the student. I think that something that I didn't even realize was something that was really important to me or who I am until the pandemic, when I really had to kind of sit down and go, okay, who am I in this big industry that we're in? What is my value? What is my strength? What is my path moving forward? Because I think we all got thrown off, whether we're in the fitness industry or any career, we all got, you know, tipped over a little bit to go, wait, I'm not doing what I used to do. Now what? And so a big part for me was to really define who I am. It comes back to you when you were saying in the introduction, your why, you you know, who are you? What is your why? And the first thing I identified for myself is I'm a student and I will always remain a student. I want to be the learner. I want to continue to learn from everyone I meet and keep gathering knowledge and expertise in whatever field it's going to be. And then the second part for that is be the educator, you know, share then what you know. So be the student and continue to grow and learn. And that's why I think I, you know, have been with CamFit Pro and IDEA and other organizations for as long as I have been is because I do see myself as a student and, and, but I also see myself as an educator. It's like, I've learned these things, I've gathered this information and I want to share it. And that's kind of the two sides of, of who I am and why I think I continue to grow within the industry. Absolutely. Grow, reinvent yourself, help to reinvent the industry. Perfect segue to the question of um, having, you know, birthed the sport of synchronized swimming, having grown the fitness industry for four decades. And as both a student and an educator, What have you learned most recently about the sport and about the fitness industry that you can tell us in terms of future trends? Uh, We're embarking on a new year. What do you see for the sport of synchro and what do you see in the fitness industry? mm, Oh, the crystal ball. If I had the crystal ball, right. And I could tell you what was going to happen. I don't know for sure for the court, the, the, for the force for sport, uh, the synchronized swimming has always been a strong female sport. And so I'm all, I've always been an advocate for women in sport. And I believe that women still need to stand up. They need to stand up for themselves. They need to stand up. They have to have a voice in sport. We're doing better. Uh, But the future I believe is we have to continue to do that as women in sport and, and be the strong advocate for other women in sport and bring girls up and give them the opportunity to, to experience what you have, Mo, and I have through sport that then will affect their entire lives. So that's from the sports perspective. From the fitness perspective, I think we're in a huge time of change. And people need us more than they've ever needed us before. We've always known that we are part of the health and wellness equation. We, as in the fitness professionals, have always known that, but we've never been recognized for that. And I do think we need to have a bigger voice in that arena, in that we are a big part of mental health. We are a big part of people's well-being. We create communities where people are lonely. People are suffering from loneliness after the pandemic and they've not come out of their shells yet. Uh, We create those environments. We are the facilitators of positive environments for people. So I think a pathway or a journey that I, I see us in the fitness industry taking is that health and wellness approach. And I know that we've talked about it visually. We still see on social media, everybody's flaunting their most beautiful body. We have to get away from that. We have to come to 
it's not about body beautiful. And we've been talking about it for years, but we're still seeing it. We need to move towards health, wellness, mental health. And we know that happens through fitness and activity. Mm-hmm. Very good. They're beautifully said, Miss Educator. <laughs> And it is, we are embarking on a new year for the, for, I mean, the world, of course, but in yeah. the fitness industry, and there is um, exactly, I, you, you know, you've, you've shared similar thoughts to many of the owners and operators about so much change ahead, but we also need to um, have a voice and yeah. ask for what the industry needs in terms of recognition Mm-hmm. And also be the student. We can't just expect to receive the respect. We got to earn it. And earning it is, you know, again, being authentic. It's not about the physical body and the marketing you put up because it attracts prospects. It's about who you truly are and how you want to represent health and well, well-being mm-hmm. for your community. And that in itself takes courage because it's not necessarily the way that it has worked in the past. And uh, I love, I love what you shared there. And, and I agree with you on that one. It's not, it goes back to what we talked way back at the beginning. It is not the easy path. It is the one that's going to be challenging. And it is the one that is going to be easy to say, let's just fall back into our old habits. Yeah. Right. Because right. our old habits were successful, but if we really want to change, we got to change. <laughs> and that is where opportunity knocks. Yes. Yeah. All right. Last question. Um, Before I ask the last question, it's a question I've asked every one of my guests this year, the theme being that of courage. I do want to ask you, uh, Helen, how can people connect with you or learn what you're doing these days? I know you are up to some amazing things at the Academy. Tell us more and how people can connect with you. So you can connect to, to me personally. Uh, I have a website, so HelenVanderberg.com. Uh, you can just connect to me through my website, and the website will then lead you to any education that I have online. I do have some video education, streaming education that's online. Um, my social media pages are probably the, the way to see what I'm doing in in the immediate future. They're the most current. So Instagram, I'm on Instagram, Helen Vandenberg, um, and on uh, Facebook. Those are the two platforms I'm on. I'm not doing TikTok yet. I just can't handle more than two. So <laughs> I'm on, the, on Facebook and Instagram. You can follow me, Helen Vandenberg. And then my company, The Academy, uh, here in Calgary, we do, we're a local business in Calgary. So open our doors to everybody here in Calgary, but we also do live streaming. So you can come and do a workout with me if you want. I'll, you know, wow. do a live stream. Come and work out with me during the week. I did not even know that. Yeah, there you, you heard it here. We can work out with Alan Vandenberg. You can. I, I love that. What a great idea. Ooh. Yeah, I'm you gonna, can live stream in with me. I like that. I and, um, ears open, everyone, because I have a feeling we're going to hear about this in the CanFit Pro fitness trends predictions of what is going to be up front for 2024. So Helen, my closing question I've been asking everyone. And so for you, that will be mm-hmm. one of my last four. It will be the last for the year is what, what have you been working on or what are you working on tw- in this year, 2023, that has been calling on your courage? Mm. Mm. <laughs> what I have been working on and calling on my courage is as much as I am a student and educator, I'm also humble, maybe too humble, and not very good at getting the word out of what I'm doing. For example, you didn't even know I did live streaming classes. So uh, one of my big goals is just to to let people know uh, that I am available, that I'm accessible, uh, whether that is like if you need to talk to me and ask a question or whether it is you, you need me to come and do an education session for you. That's sort of my big challenge is that I think I've my own personal self-evaluation is I've taken a back seat and let things happen. Um, moving forward, I want to step into uh, that educator role, you know, that mm. I'm available to people. Wow. Yeah. Wow. That's amazing. I love that. Great answer. Every answer is great, but I love that because again, it's so humble 
And um, it really does step you into the role that you are, but being the student of that lesson that you are educating others about. And I'm certain people will be inspired to ask the same question for themselves. So if you haven't had that opportunity to reflect on what is calling on your courage this year, please take the opportunity to think about that, journal it, speak to somebody about it, reach out to Helen, reach out to myself. Mm -hmm. You can follow me on my blogs, on my website, mohagan.com. Of course, the podcast, this is lucky number 13. And wow, it's not only been lucky, but rich with conversation and um, experiences, truly an example of what living your legacy is all about. So Helen, on behalf of me and my community, Thank you so much for being here today. It's uh, truly, it's been amazing. And the only thing that is missing that we've done when we get together and chat in the otherwise is that glass of vino. I know we don't have a glass of wine here today. Maybe next time. <laughs> so for those who know, Helen and I do happy hours virtually with a glass of wine to catch up. Yeah. And uh, it's a great way that we can sort of share experiences and, uh, and lend advice and, and, uh, serve our purpose, right? Because I Absolutely. always love reaching out and asking you what yeah. you're up to and what um, what you've learned because it helps me to understand that it's okay to not know what the heck you're doing sometimes because, you know, if Helen doesn't know sometimes what she's doing, then <laughs> I must be okay. <laughs> I, I'm yeah. truly, truly grateful. Thank you so much. And uh, I'm, I know I'm not going to let you go quite yet, Mo. You're not going quite yet. I need to have a final word and oh. that we need to give Mo Hagen recognition for what she's giving to all of you, because being able to take the time to bring on the guests and ask these questions and then have a place for us to go and be inspired by other people. So thank you for being a leader in sharing and you've always been so good at this, of, of, of being uh, an instigator of bringing people together. So mm. thank you. Thank you. I'm an instigator. I like that. Or an instigator of bringing people together. <laughs> thank you, Helen. I love you. Thank you, everyone, for being here. And until next time, get out there. Live your legacy. 